Here we're going to look at an example of Euler where he bent the rules to assign a value to a clearly divergent series. And then we're going to compare it with a, another clearly divergent series that looks very much related, but you can't assign a value to it. So let's see exactly what we're talking about. So we will assign a value to the following divergent series. Notice it's the alternating sum of the factorials. 1, which is 0 factorial, minus 1 factorial, plus 2 factorial, minus 3 factorial, so on and so forth. But we'll show that it's not possible to assign a value to just the sum of the factorials. And of course I'm saying assign a value instead of calculate the sum because like I've said a few times these are clearly divergent series. So this is in the spirit of the sum of the natural numbers is minus 1 over 12 which does have some meaning with respect to the Riemann zeta function. Okay so anyway let's get to it. So we're going to investigate this first one first the one that we can assign a value to. Okay. So let's introduce a variable. And so let's set y equal to x minus x squared, and then plus 2 factorial times x cubed, minus 3 factorial times x to the fourth, plus 4 factorial times x to the fifth, so on and so forth. And why did we start at x instead of at a constant? Well, I think it's because of this. So let's notice that y of 0 is equal to 0, and y evaluated at 1 is what I'll call our goal. But then also, if we take the derivative, that builds these factorials into the next factorial. So the 3 drops down and that 2 factorial will become a 3 factorial and then that extends on and on and on. So not only do we have y of 0 is 0 kind of obviously and y of 1 is our goal, but we've got this nice structure with the factorial and the derivative. Okay, so let's write that down. So we have y prime is equal to 1 minus 2 times x plus, now it's 3 factorial times x squared minus 4 factorial times x cubed plus 5 factorial times x to the fourth, so on and so forth. But now we'd somehow like to build y prime until it starts to look like y. And notice we can, and if we multiply by x squared, we're almost there because that'll bring the 1 up to an x squared, the 2x to a 2 factorial x cubed, and so on and so forth. So let's maybe do that now. So multiply this by x squared. So we'll have x squared y prime is equal to x squared minus 2x cubed plus 3 factorial x to the fourth minus 4 factorial x to the fifth, so on and so forth. But that's exactly what we started with. Well, actually it's the negative of what we started with, but we're also missing x. So perhaps we could write this as x minus what we started with. So x minus y. But now look at what we've got. We've got a differential equation for y. So perhaps we can solve this differential equation. And in fact, we can. So let's rewrite this in the following maybe more standard way for a differential equation. We have y prime plus 1 over x squared times y equals 1 over x. And in this format, this is a so-called first order linear differential equation. And there's like a standard way to do a solution for this, but I'm going to sketch the derivation of that standard method. Uh, allowing us maybe to look at some more detail here. Okay, so now I'm going to start by multiplying this by a so-called integrating constant, and I'll call that integrating constant alpha of x. So that'll give me alpha times y prime, and then plus alpha over x squared times y equals alpha over x, where I'm thinking, like I said before, as alpha as a function of x. But why would we do this? Well, the goal here is to choose alpha so that this left-hand side of the equation is nice. 
So in other words, we want this to be equal to the derivative with respect to x of y times alpha. But if we had that, then this would be really nice. Everything would simplify quite nicely. So let's see what condition we need for that to occur. So let's take this derivative using the product rule. That'll give us alpha prime times y plus alpha times y prime. But let's underline what we've got. So we want this stuff, which is overlined in peach, to be equal to this stuff, which is overlined in peach on the other end. But they already share a term. Notice they share this brown underlined term. So what that means is that the remaining term has to be equal. So in other words, this red underlined term must be equal to this red underlined term. And then we have achieved our goal. So let's maybe bring that kind of red underlined equation down. So I'll put it as a red box right here. So we've got alpha over x squared times y equals alpha prime times y. But now we can divide both sides by y and then rewrite some things and we see that we have alpha prime over alpha is equal to one over x squared. But now we can take the antiderivative of both sides and we'll see that the natural log of alpha is equal to negative one over x. You might say plus a constant, but we'll take care of the constant later. And then exponentiating both sides, we'll have alpha is equal to e to the minus one over x. Okay, so there we have it. We have our so-called integrating constant. So what are we gonna do from here? Well, we're gonna take this integrating constant and plug it into this differential equation. So we'll have the derivative with respect to x of alpha times y is equal to this alpha over x. So let's start with that on the next board. So after building a differential equation and then doing this monkey business with the integrating factor, we got down to the following spot. So from here, I'll take the antiderivative of both sides because I've got the derivative of something. So that leaves me with this. So I'll have y times e to the minus one over x over here on the left-hand side because the derivative and the antiderivative cancel each other. And then this thing on the right-hand side doesn't have an elementary antiderivative, so we'll write it symbolically. This will be the integral from zero up to x of, let's see, e to the minus one over t over t dt. And then you might say, well, plus a constant, but we in fact don't need a constant here because if we evaluate this at x equals zero, well, we can't really evaluate it at x equals zero, but we can take the limit as x approaches zero. You'll see that we get e to the minus infinity, which is zero over here, and we get zero over here. So that means that we don't need any other like constant of integration. Okay, so that gives us this value for y. y is equal to e to the one over x times the integral from zero to x of e to the minus one over t over t dt. Good. And you can check that that integral in fact converges. That's because as you approach zero from above, this numerator dies off much more quickly than the denominator. Okay, well, let's note that if we evaluate this at x equals one, we have our goal. And so we could write this down. I'll just write goal. By goal, I mean this thing over here is equal to e times the integral from zero to one of e to the minus one by t over t dt. So there we've done it. We've assigned a value to our divergent series. And in fact, this is a kind of well-known constant called the Gompertz constant, and it's sometimes denoted by gamma. So there we have that as well. So that's kind of interesting. Okay, so maybe before we move on to this second series, I'd like to look at a couple more representations of this constant. Okay, so this is where we ended up on the last board. This interesting constant could be assigned for the value of our divergent series. And there are some interesting facts about this constant. First of all, it's unknown if it's irrational, 
But that being said, it's been proven that at least this constant or the Euler-Mascheroni constant, gamma, is transcendental. So at least one of those is. I would speculate that we probably believe that both of them are. Okay, so now let's do some changes of variables with this integral to get some other representations of this constant. Okay, so let's start with the following change of variables. So I'm gonna set u and set it equal to e to the one minus one over t. Okay, but let's see. After solving for one over t, that gives us the following expression. So one over t is one over one minus the natural log of u. So you can do that with fairly simple methods. Okay, but that means that t is equal to one minus natural log of u, which in turn means dt is equal to one over u. Okay, so now I think we're ready to stick this inside of the integral. So now we have delta is equal to e times the integral from zero to, well, it's gonna be zero to one again, just given this change of variables. And then notice my one over t, which is by this t in the denominator is one over one minus the natural log of u, but we've got more. We've got this dt, which gives us a one over u. Oh, but then also we've got this e to the minus one over t, but that e to the minus one over t is simply u over e, so that'll cancel this u here as well as this e right here. And there we have it. We've got another integral representation of this constant. I think this is maybe a nicer integral representation. And now let's maybe look at one more. So for our next change of variables, let's go ahead and set u equal to e to the x. So that's motivated by just a simplification there, equal to e to the minus x. So that's gonna simplify this thing. Okay. So now let's note when u is equal to zero, that means that x is approaching infinity. And then when u is equal to one, that means that x is equal to zero. So that's what happens to our bounds of integration. Furthermore, du is minus e to the minus x dx. Okay, so let's see what that leaves us with. So now we'll have delta is equal to, so we'll have the integral starting at infinity and ending at zero, but we can maybe take this minus sign and have it flip them. So that'll go from zero to infinity. And then we'll have our du gives us an e to the minus x in the numerator. And then in the denominator, we have one plus x, just based off of this rule right here, taking the log of this. Okay, so that's another nice representation of this constant. And before I forget, I'd like to point out that we can write out the first few terms of this constant as follows. So it's 0 0.5963 and so on and so forth. Okay, so there we have it. We learned about a new constant which was assigned to the value of this obviously divergent series. And we saw one, two, three integral representations of this constant. Now let's maybe go through a similar thing with this series and see what goes wrong. Okay, so now let's outline a similar attempt for this non-alternating sum of the factorials. So we would start by setting y equal to x plus x squared plus two factorial x cubed, so on and so forth. Take its derivative. Notice that that builds the following differential equation. x squared y minus y equals x. Now you can solve that via similar methods to see that y equals e to the minus one over x times the quantity, integral from zero to x of e to the one over t over t, dt plus some constant. But here's the problem. This integral, which I have underlined in blue, never converges if we have a lower bound of zero. So that's why this doesn't work. And we in fact kind of need a lower bound of zero given that, that will serve as our initial condition because that's the only reliable value of this for x's. Well, actually, if we're looking at this as a series, like a power series, this only converges at x equals zero. So we're kind of cheating anytime we go beyond that. Okay, but anyway, 
that means we need this lower bound of zero, but that causes a problem. So that means this strategy cannot be used to assign a value to this obviously divergent series. That doesn't mean that a technique doesn't exist that would assign a value, it just means that this one doesn't. And in fact, I'm not sure if there is one or not. Maybe if you know, post it in the comments. And if you're still here and you haven't subscribed, consider subscribing. It really helps us out. And that's a good place to stop.